Good afternoon, all of you. Thank you. Well done for getting your lunch done in time and coming back. Thanks to all of you that are on time. Um, welcome to this afternoon's session. My name is Lisa Knights, and I'll be moderating this session and the next one following straight through. Uh, just a d d disclaimer, uh, my title is Chief of Media and Comms for the Bristol Sport Group, which is Steve Lansdowne's company based at Ashton Gate Stadium in Bristol. Um, that sporting group includes Bristol City Football Club, the men and the women, Bristol Rugby, men and women, uh, the Flyers basketball team who play in the top flight of the BBL, and also Bristol Sport Racing, which has an interest in the Porsche Carrera Cup GB tournament. In 2016, Ashton Gate completed a two-year, £45 million rebuild of the stadium to transform it into a 27,000 multi-sport venue. Uh, fit, a venue fit for the top flight, not just in sport, but also in conferencing and events. Steve Lansdowne's vision was to make his home city birth a sporting city, uh, with a stadium that everyone could be proud of. And, and so it has proved that this stadium could then generate revenue all year round, rather than just on the match days. And it has happened. In the first full year of our business, the hospitality side has grown from 250,000 to just over two and a half million. Um, and it's seen us steal a march on the previous leaders in the conference and events providers in our area. So if you will, please take a look at the new era that is Ashton Gate. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me, yeah, it's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me, and I'm feeling good. The sold out signs are up as a new era begins. Lee Johnson follows in his father's footsteps by taking charge at Ashton Gate. I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm dead chuffed and delighted to be back. Welcome to the stage, Mark Kelly, Martin Griffiths. Martin Griffiths, the chairman of Ashton Gate, and Mark Kelly, our managing director. <coughs> now, I sit there and watch that, and having been involved in that rebuild <coughs> for the last three or four years, Martin, mm. you were there from the very start. Um, it's been quite a journey. 
Yeah, I, this thing all started really in um, the summer of 2012. And anyone who knows the history of Bristol City and stadiums will know around that time, uh, the club had run aground with uh, plans for a new build stadium in a, in a field just on the outskirts of Bristol. Um, and uh, Steve, uh, Steve Lansdowne just phoned me up and said, look, could you just uh, give, us a, give me a bit of your time and come and have a look and see where we are uh, and how we can try and resolve it. And I think in the first week, uh, I felt that uh, it was going to take years and years to bring the stadium at Ashton Vale, as it was, to fruition. So my view was, why don't you rebuild Ashton Gate? Uh, and at the time, I think the prevailing wisdom was that uh, the footprint was too small, you couldn't do that. Uh, but my view was that was simply a matter of design, purely about design. And um, I think my words to Steve were, as long as you don't let, uh, and forgive me, an architect loose uh, in terms of designing this stadium, uh, and you're commercially led right from the start, it'll be fine. And you, I'm sure it can be rebuilt at Ashton Gate. And so it has been successfully rebuilt. You talk about design from a commercial perspective. So what exactly does that look like? This, this session is entitled From the Till Up because mm. it pretty much did start with you drawing a till in what is now today's coffee shop. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I'm, my background's hospitality in the hotel industry uh, for many years. And um, I uh, press ganged my architect who'd built a number of hotels for me to getting involved uh, in the stadium build. And we sat down and I said, look, um, the point of sale, as far as I can see today, is a till. Uh, and uh, Bristol City are going to play 24, 25 times here at Ashton Gate. I didn't know that we were going to code share at that point. That came later. Um, but we need to be full 365 days of the year. So how are we going to yield the space? Because in hospitality, if anyone's involved in that industry, there are two rules in design. One is yield per square meter how much money, how much revenue can you generate, and you have to justify every square meter in that building. And the second is the operating cost. What's the operating cost of this building going to be for the next 20 to potentially 50 years, which is the lifetime of the building? So we started with a till. Every decision, every design decision after that was made. How do we yield the space? The design was built around that basic concept of yield. You, you talk about designing the space, but it, it's an interesting anecdote because I know when we first met, you talked about designing the space. And I was like, yeah, but what, what does that actually mean? Let, give me mm. something that I can write about. And you gave the example of how conference and events facilities are divided up to optimize that there isn't a gap between event stands. Yeah, uh, the, the, um, particularly if you just take the West stand, the, uh, the, the mandate that I gave the architect was to say, I need to have a, uh, a, a banqueting room for uh, between 800 and 1,000 people, no columns. Because in the hospitality industry, columns kill. Uh, and so we don't want any columns in that space. And by the way, I also want in the design, the concourse to be designed as an exhibition grid, i.e. the pillars are spaced a very precise way so that a standard prefabricated exhibition stand can go in those slots. So that is why the stand is designed in the way it is, because we knew immediately all the revenue would be driven off the ground floor, then off that big banqueting room, given our look at the local market. And that then just lent itself naturally to the boxes, which doubled as meeting rooms on the floor above that, and so on. And, and frankly, uh, and, and this is probably going to sound uh, heresy, but the, the seats were the last thing we thought about. It's just concrete and plastic. It was everything which would drive corporate business inside that West Stand. And the seats just sit on top of that at a particular angle. Um, for those of you that paid attention during the video, the, the cantilevered stand, the double-tiered stand that you see, the reason why it is cantilevered is so that it can have that, that banqueting space without any yeah. columns through it. Yeah. And your, your background, as you've mentioned, is from the hotel industry. And when you had to look to appoint someone that was actually going to run this stadium and manage it day to day, you looked to your own industry. Yeah, um, Mark, Mark had worked with me um, in my previous life. Um, uh, involved in running a, a complicated uh, hotel and, and particularly a conference hotel in the centre of Birmingham. Uh, and I'd heard a rumour that he'd washed up in Portishead, which is a small town just outside Bristol. So I uh, set people onto it and it transpired that was true. And so I tapped you up, basically, I think, that would be the phrase. <laughs> oh, how Here is it to be tapped up? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
look, it, yeah, it was a great opportunity um, to come from the hotel industry where uh, it's, it's quite a simple, although complex model of selling rooms for the highest rate you can get as many days as possible and filling space to, um, in, in the early days, redeveloping a, a 45 million pound stadium live. I mean, you say live. I mean, it, it's a, an analogy that we often mention at work. It's like building an aircraft whilst in flight because certainly doing the, the two-year rebuild, we happened to embark upon it during a season, 14-15, when both Bristol City and Bristol Rugby went on their most successful ever campaign runs, but winning both their, their league and their cup. So the demand on what was a very complicated and tight timeline was, was huge to fit that through. Talk us through some of the complications that, that you encountered. Yeah, some, some of the main parts of development were, were mid-season. Um, both teams were doing very well. Bristol City were unbeaten for, for a long period of time. Uh, in the context of, of the stadium, the old East Stand had been, uh, been demolished. So capacity was around 12, 12 and a half thousand. Uh, and we're filling. So during that time, we were developing the, the Dolman. Um, we had season ticket holders in there. So we had to reallocate every other week as we demolished the lower part of, this, of the Dolman, uh, reallocate season ticket holders and keep on moving them as the development, uh, development grew. Um, fantastic experience. Not too sure it's one I'd want to go into head first <laughs> again. Uh, heavily, heavily um, under the cosh with the safety advisory group as you'd expect and Bristol City Council. Um, weekly meetings, you know, you're essentially turning a building site into a football stadium with 12 and a half to 13, a rugby stadium, 1,000 people every week. So from, from Saturday, sometimes 11 o'clock, we, we were given handover back from the builders and we'd hand it back again at five, six o'clock. Builders would work 24, you know, 24 to seven days a week to, to catch up. Uh, the weather wasn't particularly great that particular year um, and some of the building work was delayed. I think we had one of the rainiest years, even mm. by West Country standards, uh, yeah. that year. Actually, it turned out to be very good experience doing that whole handing over to building contractors and then us taking it for match day and handing it back. It actually proved very good preparation for the opening of the South Stand and the Double Tiered West Stand because both of those, we didn't actually get completion and sign off. If memory serves 24 hours or less, less than 24 yeah. hours yeah, of less. match day. Yeah, we had, I mean, Martin can, can fill the blanks. We, on both handovers of the phases, we had the safety advisor group holding our safety certificate in their hand at 10 to 5, 5 o'clock, saying they're not going to sign when we have a sell out the next day. Um, and you know, the team were, were running behind us, putting up fire exit signs and, and ensuring that it, it, the building is safe and, and, and capable as it was. But yeah, it's some, some real difficult, um, difficult times trying to get the stadium open. And that's due to the nature of the build, really. It's, it's how the build went. It was the phasing. There were some real aspirational projects which needed to happen in a certain period of time, roof trusses and, and, and other parts of the development, um, which, which delayed, and it, it was delayed. Martin, you've been involved with the club and living in Bristol for many years. Um, how difficult was it? We've talked about the design build, but how difficult was it talking to fans? Because actually you had to manage two sets of fans and make them very much feel that it was their home. Bristol City's home had been at Ashton Gate, for a hundred odd years. Bristol Rugby were new to it. How could you, in the design, accomplish your vision of doing the commercial side of it, but also make the fans and put them first? That, uh, the, the only thing you can do is to spend a lot of time uh, with different fan groups, because if, you know, the Bristol City uh, average home crowd now is sort of 18 to 20,000, 20, 21 and a half thousand against Villa last week. Uh, Bristol Rugby, when it's in the Premiership, can be anything. Um, particularly when you've got local derbies against Bath and Gloucester, you can get up to that 15 or 20,000 as well. So there's a big fan pool out there. And, and the way primarily um, I decided to do that, uh, under the old East Stand, there's a huge uh, space, and again, another columnless space, the Dolman Hall, uh, which a former chairman built because he loved his crown green bowling. Uh, but it always rains in Bristol, so we had two indoor bowl, bowling pitches built, so it had to be a columnless space. And the idea was just fill that space with fans, but don't demarcate between rugby and football, have both sets in that room at the same time. Uh, have no particular set agenda, but just allow fans to say, right, what you want to know. And uh, that is by far and away the best, in my view, that's the 
by far and away the best way to consult with people is just be absolutely authentic and honest. If you can't do something, you need to say you can't do it up front. Uh, I, I mean, the question I probably got asked a hundred times is, are the seats going to be red? That was absolutely the critical issue because, of course, rugby play in dark blue, Bristol City play in red. Uh, and I could feel some sort of Korean standoff coming over the color of seats. Uh, and in the end, we just decided they're going to have to be red. Um, and, and that's it. Once we got through that, then you get to the more detailed sort of where's the bar going to be? Is there going to be a bar? Um, and you, you're accommodating lots of different interest groups. But in essence, um, if you get the design right, it means you've thought about what each group of people coming to that stadium on match day will require, as, as well as non-match day. And it's a big building. Uh, you should be able to accommodate most things that most people want. You, you've talked about getting the fans on board, but I guess one of the biggest things, and I'm sure anyone who works in football knows how receptive fans are to lots of change and new things coming in. Um, how difficult, Mark, was it to change a fan culture that was very different in, in two sports. You know, football fans and rugby fans have a very different culture within their sports. Both celebrated fiercely, both protected fiercely. How did you set about changing that and also making that a commercial viable go? Yeah, I, look, I, I think it's, it's cliche, but it's a bit of an evolution, really. Um, before we had to change or work with the fans, we had to work with the police and the authorities. And that was important. We, again, Bristol City fans were, were under the cost of the police. And we, you know, they, were, they weren't allowed to do much in the stadium. They, they, can we put a bar in a car park and, because the facilities weren't great? No, you can't. Why not? I don't know, but you can't. You know, it, it, something could happen. So we had to change and work with the police and the authorities in the first instance to make sure they were comfortable with what we were doing. And, and that had its own challenges. And, and we're in a great place, by the way, with, with both the safety advisory group and the local police now. Um, it, it is about, as Martin said, providing them facilities which they're proud of and, and they want to use. Bristol City fans traditionally um, packed the gate, so they were there sort of 8, 10, 12 minutes before kickoff, queued for a long time to get in because the old turnstiles, um, that's by design, that's how they were. Didn't really spend much. The average spend in the stadium was about 85 pence. Um, we, we were using a, a third party contract caterer. It wasn't great. And so it, the important thing was actually what what's important to a fan? A good pie, a good pint, good value for money. So you know, we, we went out and we sourced. It took us six months to source a really, really good local pie. Um, we worked with the breweries and we heavily discount. I discounted 150 grand last year back to season ticket holders through their season ticket program. So through loyalty, you, you get up to 20, 25%. Um, learning from rugby, where traditionally they were left alone by the police authorities. Yeah, you can drink in the car park, you can have a live band, you can do what you want. Um, it's trying to learn some of the, their cultures and bring their cultures together to the football. And we've, we've done that very well. We've created a fan village in the car park. So, you know, a, a great complaint I had, I was saying to you this morning, a great complaint I had was that somebody turned up for the um, Aston Villa game two hours before kickoff and they couldn't get a seat. You know, well, that, that, that's a brilliant complaint and, and we'll deal mm. with that. But actually, that means they are turning up two hours before kickoff. So there's a fan village in the car park, there's, there's a wide choice of food and drink, there's, there's always live music, and it becomes a thing, it's a day out. And also looking after the families, get, you know, getting the seven-year-olds in with their, with their parents and, and building the next generation, uh, and ensuring that everybody, whether they're a hospitality or a general fan, gets the, the same contextual experience. You, you talk about changing that behaviour of, of, of fans, but it's also about the behaviour and culture within the staff. I mean, not least you talk about taking things in-house. That was one of Steve Lansdowne's vision was to try and source everything local. So from, from the build process of the local contractors to actually now the stadium opening with the coffee shop that is set up by two local guys who brew their own beans in, in South Bristol. Um, it isn't a Starbucks or, or a Costa. That's happened as well within the workforce and the resource management side of it. Yeah, we, we took catering in-house, uh, which had its own challenges. We, we did it in a very short period of time. We uh, three months to build a brand new catering operation in, in a new development. Um, we have uh, up to a thousand staff on the Ashton Gate box. They're very young, uh, quite surprisingly young. The average age in hospitality is 18, which again has its own challenges. But some positives from that, the average age of 18 with, with a payroll of one and a half million into the local BS3, which is the local area to, to Ashton Gate, postcode is brilliant. So there's a, there's a huge level of employment 
which we're, we're providing to 18-year-old to plus. And you know, not all of these are students coming in from, from different cities. D this is the local community. We have a number of 18-year-old um, plus on, on apprenticeships, and we're putting a number of um, employees through college and through university. And, and there's a real succession plan and development into our people at that level. We also took stewarding in-house, <coughs> okay, which had its own, its own challenges. But again, you know, the stewarding workforce is up to 300 average age of 45, so it's a different demographic, and, and we're working with them, we're putting the stewards through a, a, an education program, an MBQ program, really trying to develop, not just them, but for us to get, to get a, a, an increased level of service. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a great experience doing that. Yeah, and I guess you, you talk about this fan village, you saw some of the shots in the opening video of how packed that outer fan village is and how early fans are arriving now towards rugby and football games. Of course, Martin, none of that is possible without the technology <laughs> underlying it to support it and and most stadia across the world struggle with that connectivity side of it but that was something that um, underpinned the design process from day one yeah i think um we you started today or on perhaps not today but if i go back three or four years when we started the design process the till is uh, was your point of sale still predominantly you can use a credit card you can use cash but a till is the point of sale um, and then having sat down and for six months through that initial design phase, uh, the person I spent most time with in that design phase was our head of IT. And uh, because I just had a feeling that the way that smartphone technology was developing, although Attil was the main point of sale in 2012, 2013, now and probably two to three years from now, the main point of sale will be a smartphone. Uh, and I came in at the end of the previous session here, um, talking about uh, fan engagement and content and whatnot. Uh, well, none of that's going to work unless the stadium has an effective uh, digital environment so that uh, thousands and thousands of fans can actually log on. It's the basic plumbing in a stadium. So right from the start, we said, uh, I want a massive fiber optic digital ring to go right around the stadium uh, and for that to connect through two points with two different providers out into the wider digital network um, so that if and when we get to the point where we have um, 10, 20,000 concurrent users, they're not going to want to just look at bland uh, two-dimensional information on their smartphone. They're going to want to stream. And that requires colossal bandwidth. Um, and so there's only one way you can do that, and that is provide the infrastructure in a stadium in the first place so that you can get to multiple thousands of people, concurrent users who can then stream live content. Mm. And, and that's something that's going on right now. The partnership, as we've mentioned about sourcing local, the partnership is with a local company. They were a spin out from Bristol University called Zeta Networks. Mm. And they are trying to pull off what will be a world first of being able to have in bowl Wi-Fi mm. up to 12,000 at the same time, which is what we're testing at the moment. Yeah, I, I think um, the it, it, it's very experimental technology, but there, there's two or three reasons why um, I think it's something we need to persevere with. And historically, uh, information technology installations in complex buildings, and, and the stadium is a complex building, are to me just horrendously expensive. And that's because that market is owned by a small number of global providers um, who dictate pricing. And it's not just the capex that goes into that, it's the operating cost that flows out of putting that installation in. Because it's proprietary technology, you pay what it costs, because if you don't want their switch, your information technology infrastructure won't work. So what we've done is teamed up with them and said, uh, look, we want to use bare metal technology. Uh, bare metal technology is basically what the branded companies make, but it doesn't have a brand on it, all made by the same people. Uh, coming out of the, the same factories, and it's about 20% of the cost. So we can build an IT infrastructure at a fraction of the cost of traditional IT backbones being built. And then the second thing is, because you've got ex this extreme technology on big fiber optic rings within a stadium, if they get the software right, and that is the key to this experiment, is to see fundamentally if we can run a stadium off software, not hardware, then uh, their ambition is when we do the final live test just before Christmas is to get to 12,000 concurrent users in bowl streaming, which sounds Im 
well, it does sound impossible. It sounded impossible two years ago. But so far, each test that we've set them uh, in those live environments, they've passed. Um, some very clever people working on it. I have to confess, I'll sit in an hour's meeting. I've got no idea what went on in that hour's meeting. So someone has to summarize it in English for me afterwards. But essentially, the technology is getting very, very close. Uh, and I believe that the future way that stadiums will be run will be of cheap, bare metal, capital expenditure technology and highly sophisticated software. And the software will direct what happens in that stadium because you can see it coming. And I guess, Mark, just finally to you, I guess that will improve and make easier your job, not just from a fan engagement point of view, but in terms of directing customers to exits, safety, offers, deals, everything. You could control the stadium from one central control point. Yeah, some of the concepts are amazing. We're just proposing, you know, if, if there is a traffic jam four miles away, we, we can push out not notifications to, to a number of fans to, to use a different route, or if there's different bars which are busy, come to a different bar using the, the heat maps. So uh, yeah, absolutely, and, and I agree with Martin. I think we're going to trial a, a cash-free bar pretty soon. Um, so you know, we are expecting Apple Pay or, or, or contact list, which, which itself would be a huge shift, especially for football, where it is fairly traditional. Um, where people come out with a you know, 20 pound in their pocket, and that's what they're going to spend. Um, fingerprint payment, I, I, I totally agree that I think in the next couple of years, the landscape will, will, will totally change. And in return, you know, we, we measure our service time quite aggressively. You know, our, our concession and retail staff are, are, are tasked to deliver a service within 35 seconds. Cash slows it down. Uh, so, for example, people take out the cash, they, <coughs> we all know ourselves as consumers. If we can remove as many barriers as possible to it, transactions, uh, the fan gets a better experience, but profitability increases and sales increase. Yeah, I mean, you talk, uh, you talk about that and in terms of speeding up the time of transactions. I guess that is across the board, changing the culture of people arriving earlier, staying, arriving earlier and staying longer. That's had a massive effect on the bottom line and the increase that you've had and you've seen. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. And, and Fan engagement is important, but so is profitability. We need to be sustainable. We need to pay for the stadium. You know, it, it, it needs to be self-sustainable. Um, yes, it, but by getting them here early and, and spreading the load with the fan village and spreading the load th through the theme concessions and coffee shops and sports bar, um, you're creating a better experience for your fan. Mm. Um, but you're also pushing revenue into different streams. And, and going back to yield, you know, we use every space possible to, to, um, to yield revenue. So in the car park, any of the concessions that for the fan village, which we don't operate ourselves, we rent it out fairly aggressively, and, and, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's a good model. And just to wrap it up, in terms of the conferencing event side, we do often have moments where we've got match days running concurrently with events on in the stadium. So Steve Lansdowne is actually getting his asset sweated to the full effect in terms of the number of meals, guests that we're welcoming through the doors in, in any one day. Yeah, conference and events have done uh, fantastically well. We are the largest venue in the southwest, so we, we have the monopoly on space, which is great, but we also need to make sure the service is brilliant because that somebody else will build a bigger, bigger stadium or a bigger conference center very soon. So we do concentrate on just the service and the space. You're right, um, we do have some internal debates with the football department. Um, football have primacy. It, it's a football stadium, it's a rugby stadium, so you know, sport comes first when, when sport's on. Um, but we're trying to integrate it. You know, I've got, I've got a couple of events coming up which wanted on a particular day, well, actually, do you want to watch football as part of your wedding? Do you want to watch football as part of your conference or rugby? Absolutely. So it, we're often a USP to, to conference bookers and conference agents, which you know, hotels can't do, conference centers can't do. And that market's doing really, really well. And we, we, we're stealing the, the market share in Bristol on, on these large events. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. How it's going. OK. I'm conscious of time, and I know it's a long afternoon. Uh, would anyone like to ask any questions? There will be some time to speak to them afterwards as well. Stunned into silence. There you go. Well, Martin Mark, thank you very much for your time Cheers. this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.